So welcome to the introduction to game design and development. We are Chris and Tammy. If you couldn't tell by now, Chris is the uh, the guy with the accent. He's he's over in South Africa, and I'm in based in West Tennessee. And in case you don't know who we are, Chris Language is the author of 3D Apple Games by Tutorials. He's also a coder, an artist, a musician, a gamer, and a dreamer. I am. Tammy Kwan, and I am the editor of 2D Apple Games by Tutorials and 3D Apple Games by Tutorials. And we'll talk about those later. Let's talk about what we're gonna be covering in this course. So basically we're gonna go over a brief history of games in the gaming industry. Then we're gonna jump down and find out what the differences are between a game designer and a game developer. There's a lot of questions, you know, between what, what am I and, and what do I do? So we're gonna cover that. We're also gonna cover the different types of game genres, which is really important. From there, we're going to cover the presentation and meaning, you know, is it 2D, is it 2.5D, is it 3D? And then we'll cover some programming languages. We'll see what type of options you have in that arena, in that space. We'll then cover some graphics APIs and game engines. And we'll talk a little bit about the game design document. From there, we'll wrap things up. We'll talk about game assets, including some art, music, and sound effects. And then we'll talk about the tools of the trade. And by that, I mean, you know, what, what can you use to help you build these games? Some of the things we're not going to talk about. This is a beginner class. This is an introduction. We're not going to be discussing, you know, how to code or how to create art or, or any of that stuff. We're basically going to introduce you to game design and development. Uh, we do have advanced courses for later that we'll be presenting, but this is a beginner course. So let's talk about the beginning of the gaming industry, right? Where, where did it all start? Well, it started a really long time ago, back in 1958. A guy with the name of Willie, that's what he went by around the office. He created Tennis for Two, and this game was basically done on an oscilloscope, and these had these little... Um, aluminum controllers that they would work and send that little ball back and forth. And that was in 1958. And to be honest with you, that was not the first video game. Uh, I believe the first video game was back in 1947. It was a cathode raid tube amusement device. It was de designed by a guy named Thomas T. Holdsmith Jr. and S.L. Ray Marin. And again, that was in 1947. Things started to get a lot faster in 1962. We came out with Space War, and that's probably the most important and influential game in the early history of video games. It's one of the earliest ones known to digital computer games to be available outside of a single research facility. So that's kind of interesting. That's really where it all started. Once it got out of the research facility in 1972, this tiny little company named Atari, you probably heard of them, they created Pong, and that was really the first video game arcade system was Pong. Fast forward to where we're at now. I mean, today's gaming, Chris and I, we were just talking about this CSGO, fantastic game, Hearthstone, World of Warcraft, Overwatch, of course, League of Legends, we've all heard of these games. These are fantastic games, nothing like where we started. You know, we also have other games that, that are also fantastic. You've got Don't Starve, Castle Crashers, Minecraft, Terraria. I'm sure you've all heard of some of these. And you might be wondering, oh, that's great. Why are you splitting these up in two different slides? Why, you know, why do you have one set and another set? And to be frank with you, when you're talking about game design and development, Chris, what's one of the first things people talk about? It's like, oh, indie game versus AAA, right? That's right. You've probably heard that a million times when you're just getting into this industry. And we want to kind of dispel some of the myths behind indie versus AAA. Now, the first batch of slides that you saw, you know, the one with Hearthstone, that's from Blizzard. That's what you would consider a AAA game. The second set of slide uh, games on that slide, one of them was Don't Start. That's what you would call an indie game. So taking a look at the differences between indie versus triple A, obviously the first thing that comes to mind would be your budget, right? Triple A game, I don't want to say that they have a, a limitless budget, but they certainly have a bigger budget than, let's say, Chris and I would have for creating our games. Wouldn't you say that, Chris? 
<laughs> Definitely. <laughs> And of course, their team size is going to be quite a bit larger. You know, they're typically a triple A house would have departments for the different types of things you'll be doing when you're creating your game. You know, you'll have an art department, a sound department, an animation department, a development department. And even within that, you're going to have smaller team sizes um, in the bigger environment. With an indie game, and an indie house, you might just have one person. It might just be you. It might just be two of you, like Chris and I. It could be, you know, 10 of you. Typically, it doesn't go beyond the size of 10, but it can. Another thing that's very different between indie and AAA is going to be your, your deadlines and your time frames, right? It's not to say that these things are not important in an indie game. They are very much so. You have to set deadlines and you have to set time frames. You're never going to get anything done. But they're a little more movable. They're, they're not nearly as um, constraining, right? If, if you're a AAA house, you might want to hit a target for a Christmas release or something. And, and again, yeah, indies have these, but they're not nearly as, as crushing and pressing. Same thing with the creative process and management style. Now, I've created a bunch of games myself. Chris has created a bunch of games. Certainly when he did the 3D Apple Games by tutorials, he created a bunch of games in there. And you basically, as an indie, you've kind of got your own creative process and your own management style. You are holding yourself accountable. In a AAA environment, you have to follow whatever the process is of the house. You have a manager likely that you'll be reporting to. And again, it, this isn't meaning to hit indies versus AAA in that, that, you know, battle style. It's just pointing out the differences. It, there's certainly, there's nothing saying that indie is better than AAA, or AAA is better than indie. I mean, they are what they are, and they serve two different worlds. And um, Chris and I are indie developers. I've never worked for a AAA house. I don't think you have, Chris, right? No, not at all. Yeah, so, so let's talk about some of the roles that you would be, and again, this, this course focuses on indie development. So from here on out, we'll, we'll keep our focus. <laughs> so looking at the two roles that come up primarily when you're talking about game design and development is, well, designer versus developer. How are they different and what are they? Basically, the designer is the person responsible for dreaming up the idea for the game, right? And the developer is the one that's responsible for taking that dream and turning it into a playable game. To break that down even further, the designer would come up with things like concept, characters, and story, and setting, and the gameplay, right? Chris and I are working on a game now where there's a lot of story, there's a lot of concept, and there are a lot of characters. Now, we have dual roles, we both discuss together. So in this case, there's two designers on that game. When you start talking about developers, that seems to be pretty straightforward, right? Everyone knows the developer is the one that bangs out the code. It's the one that hits the keyboard and turns those zeros and ones into something that's a playable game. But what some people don't realize is that the developer works closely with the designers, with the sound engineers, with the artists. They don't, you know, Chris, I don't know about you, but a lot of a lot of people have this idea that a developer sits in this little tiny box and they don't ever talk to anyone. And that's true to some degree, right? We, we have our boxes and we don't come out, but occasionally we have to peek our heads out and have these conversations with the designers and have these conversations with the artists. Yeah, typically a developer, <clears throat> in my eyes, is a person who converts caffeine into code. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's exactly what happens. In fact, I think I'm running low on caffeine today. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because I just said before that, you know, we're, we do dual roles here. We're both designers. We're both developers. And a lot of times in an indie game, you don't have to decide to be one or the other. You don't have to choose. You can be both, you know, and that role can change. It's It's nothing... Nothing set in stone, and I guess that's one of the reasons why I don't ever see myself working at a AAA house, because I just don't think that I am capable of wearing one hat. Anyone who knows me knows I wear hats, but they have to be many. 
So now that you know the differences between the game designers and the game developers, let's go into the genres. Uh, one of the things that's really important with the genres, I always tell people, look, if you're going to write a book and you're going to try and get yourself an agent and you're going to uh, try and find a publisher, first question they're going to ask you is, what type of book are you writing? And if you don't have an answer, if you can't say a horror or a mystery or a suspense or a romance, chances are they're not going to have another conversation with you because you need to understand what it is you're doing in order to sell that, that thing, that product, that book, that game. And it's no different in game design. In games, you have different genres. You've got action, adventure, action, adventure. Yeah, things kind of get a little mucky sometimes. You've got role-playing games, simulation, strategy, sports. Uh, Chris, what's your favorite? Uh, First-person shooters um, is my favorite. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I kind of like the adventure games myself. Now, each one of these video game genres, these are what you would call the top level. We've got subgenres too in each one. For example, Overwatch is a good example of an action game. For example, we've got um, it's a platform, shooters, fighting, stealth games, survival games. You've seen these. I know you've all seen these. For the adventure games, I really like the adventure games. I grew up playing text adventure games. Uh, once they started to create more graphics, the text quickly went into graphic games. A lot of point and click comes to mind, like Day, uh, Day of the Tentacle. There's real-time 3D adventures, visual novels, interactive movies. Something that comes to mind with that is uh, there was an old game, Phantasmagoria, which was a fantastic interactive movie. We've got action adventure games, which is kind of well, exactly what it says, a mixture of action and adventure. Uh, survival horror, Metroidvania. A good example of this would be Dishonored 2. Got role playing games. This is what Chris was talking about before the action RPGs. Um, these are tactical games like Call of Duty, World of Warcraft. These can be first person shooters, uh, fantasy game choices. One of the ones that I really enjoyed, my favorite role playing game was uh, Fable. I think they've got three, three of them out now. It was an excellent game. You would come in, you'd, you'd build your character. And you would make choices, and those choices would play out in the real world, you know, in the, in the uh, fake real world, I should say. And the gameplay would change based on that. And if you're hearing a goat in the background, in addition to being a game person, I'm, I, I also run a farm, so that would be one of my goats. <laughs> So that's not a goat simulator running there? You see, it is a goat simulator. I just didn't want to say anything. <laughs> Speaking of simulation games, uh, there, there's not really too many of them, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes here, but simulation games typically fall into three categories, construction and management, life simulation, and vehicle simulation. The Sims definitely come to mind. Uh, Sid Meier's Civilization comes to mind. That would be like another life simulation. Long ago, there was, um, Microsoft put it out. It was a flight simulator. That would be considered a vehicle simulation. Then you've got your strategy games. These, I also like these a lot. A term that you'll hear in design and development for games is 4X, and that's explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. Now, Chris decided he wanted to make 5X, so he added Explode. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> I think those games are only done by Michael Bay. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> so also for, for strategy games, you've got real-time and turn-based strategy and tactics. You've got the multiplayer online battle arenas and tower defense games, right? Those are huge. Tower defense games are huge. For sports games, I personally, I'm not a sports game player, but my, my stepdad, he loves them. He's playing football all the time and, and uh, basketball games, soccer games like FIFA and things like that. Now, remember I said it, it gets a little bit mucky where sometimes the um, genres kind of get a little melted down together. And that's one of the things like vehicle simulation. Well, that's like a racing game, isn't it? Sports-based fighting. Isn't that kind of like a fighting game? 
yeah, you can have things interspersed and intermixed, but you have to understand where your primary target is, your primary um, genre is, and then go from there. And of course, there's always that other category, right? And no matter what you do, there's always an other category. It doesn't exactly fit in, in the norm. So where do you put it? You stick it in other things like that. Angry Birds really comes to mind with that. Um, it's a logic and puzzle game. Remember, the other categories, the top level, these would be the um, subcategories. So you've got logic and, and puzzle, party and board games, music games like Guitar Hero would be one of them. Uh, back to party and board game, party and board games, the TVOS, the Apple TV, that comes to mind a lot with the party games because they've got things on there like song pop and whatnot. And these are all games that you can make on platforms that, that you can work towards. So if we were to look at what everyone's playing, you're going to see that most people, at least in the U.S., are playing shooters and action games. Very few people are playing racing games, mostly because I think they're boring. <laughs> um, su surprisingly, only 7.8% of the people are playing adventure games, which when, when we first put together this slide, I was really surprised by that because that is one of my favorites. And a lot of people I know, that's what they play. But when you look around, yeah, the majority of people are playing action games. They're playing shooter games. They're playing role-playing games. This is where the market is. So if you're in this for the money, that's where you want to put your, your eggs. That's the sweet that. spot. <clears throat> yeah. So let's talk about your development options. Where, where can you make these games? You, you've, you've decided that, all right, you know you're an indie developer. You know that maybe you're going to be a designer as well. You go small shop. You decided that, okay, I'm going to make this type of game. This is my genre. But where do you deploy it? What are your options for that? These are pretty straightforward. If you're a game player, you already have the answers to this. You've, your consoles is probably the hardest one to get into. There's special licensing you need. It's not a cheap endeavor. But you can do it. There are indie developers on the consoles, and that, that includes PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo. Uh, probably a little bit easier to get into would be like desktop and web-based games. You know, you can do it for Windows, Mac, and the web. My personal favorite, and I think probably Chris's as well, is uh, the mobile space. There's uh, Windows and iOS and Android. Looking at the three listed up here, my choice would be iOS, personally. One thing that we didn't put on these slides, and I didn't realize it until just now, and I mentioned it before, and that's Apple TV. And again, that's if you know and learn iOS and Mac OS, Apple TV is not that difficult. Yeah, it's pretty much iOS. Yeah, pretty much, right? So again, you know, it, sometimes it does have to be about the money, and if you're looking to make money, where are you going to put your time and energy? Well, looking at the market, you're going to put it in mobile development. And there's a few reasons why that is. One, it's, it's probably the easiest space to get into as far as making games. And come on, everybody in this meeting has probably got their phone next to them, right? Some type of little mobile device, whether it be a phone, an iPad, or, or whatever the case may be. So people have that all the time, and you can be in their face more often with it. Speaking about being in their face, let's take a look at some of your design options. You know, you've, you've decided, hopefully, that you're going to work on a mobile space. It's, if you're just new to this, that's where I would recommend you go. You've got some options as far as how you want things to look. Obviously, the, the first one, pretty easy to put together, would be 2D games. Right? These are flat games, games like Limbo and Super Mario Run. These are fantastic games for 2D environments. And there's the 2.5D environment. Now, this, I'm going to say that this is somewhat new. And when I say that, I don't mean like a year new. I mean, this has been out for a good 10 years or so. Um, but when you look back, when the first video game was created in 1947, 10 years is kind of somewhat new. Nice examples of this would be Raymond's Origins or Little Big Planet. Uh, the differences between, you know, 2D and 2.5D is that 
you're not really in 3D space. And Chris can tell you a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, so things look 3D. <clears throat> it typically now these days are using 3D, but it introduces concepts like parallax scrolling, uh, 3D objects, obviously, to, to give you that 3D look and feel. But your characters are still basically stuck on a 2D plane. So if you take a look at Rayman, um, that character still just moves in a 2D plane space. Uh, so you don't have that, um, that 3D version or 3D movement space available for yourself. So that's basically where 2.5D comes in. So let's take a look at 3D. I'm a huge fan of zombies. So Black Ops 3 Zombies is on here. That's not a surprise <laughs> as a good um, environment for 3D. Battlefront 2, uh, Chris is big into Star Wars, so he put that, he put that on here. But 3D, you know, it's kind of like the best of both worlds in that um, you're you're able to bring it to life, right? You're in this you're in this fake world, and when I say best of both worlds, I don't mean the two D and the three D world. I mean the the world that you're building and the real world. This allows you to immerse your player in the game. They can three hundred and sixty degrees see everything. Things look realistic. Three D environments and three D games are great, and there are different frameworks which we'll talk about later that can help you build them. A, a lot of folks they're they get put off by 3D games. They think, gosh, it's too complicated. It's really it's out of reach. It's not, right? It's not out of reach at all. It's, yeah. So I said that we weren't going to talk about writing code and learning code in this meeting because it, it was designed for beginners. And that's true. We won't talk about how to write code, but it does, it's important mm -hmm. to understand what options there are out there to write code and what programming language there are. This slide is a little misleading because believe it or not, C Sharp is one of the most popular languages right now. It's what a lot of indie game developers are using. Um, and I say that because a lot of indie game developers are using something called Unity, which we'll talk about in a little while. Objective C and Swift is another language that a lot of indies are using and that is strictly for um, developing for Apple, and, and those would include iOS, Mac OS, TV OS, Watch OS, which we also didn't talk about before, but that is an option. You can create games for your watch. C++ and assembly, that is like, consider that the grandfather of the programming languages. It's not 100% accurate, but it's close enough. We also have Java and shader languages. And again, this, this is not all of the languages that are out there. There are many. These are just some of the most widely used ones for game development. Shader languages is something that you won't necessarily need to do if you're working with 2D. Um, sometimes you won't need to do it at all if you're working with like a 3D artist or something like that. They'll help you with the shading and programming for the shaders. <laughs> Got some scripting languages. These would include Python and JavaScript and Lua. And I know I can hear some of you thinking, wait, what is the difference between a programming language and a scripting language? And that's a really good question. And I'm going to throw that over to Chris to answer because I like to throw him under the bus and he explains things way better. Okay, cool. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> oh, no problem, man. Uh, so programming languages, uh, basically the main difference is it's a pre-compiled language and a scripting language is a language that's uh, running in run, uh, runtime basically. Um, that's the main difference. Where scripting comes into play is where they, you build AI maybe for a, a game character. Um, those types of things are typically scripting. Something we, we're not showing here. We, which Tammy just talked about is C Sharp um, in Unity space. It's also a, a scripting language, uh, which means it's not compiled at um, or pre-compiled. It's actually compiled at runtime. See, this is why I throw him under the bus. He's so good at stuff like this. 
All right, so let's talk about graphics, these low-level graphics APIs. Right now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this at all because, to be honest with you, these are the three heavy hitters right here. You've got Microsoft DirectX, OpenGL, ES, and Metal. And Metal is strictly for uh, the Apple environment. You're not going to be playing in this space unless you intend to make your own game engines. These are not... These are not frameworks that you'll be using to create games. These are frameworks that you would be using to um, create game engines. And to be honest with you, I have taught metal classes before, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great language. It's very powerful. There are things, if you watch the Apple keynote, metal can do some incredible things. But if, if you're just getting into this and you're just wanting to create a nice, simple game, let me put it to you this way. If you wanted to put a triangle on the screen, a 3D triangle on the screen on an, on an Apple product, and you use something like Scene Kit, you can have it done in like what, Chris, two, three lines of code? Uh, yeah, about three lines of code. Yeah. And in Metal, you need about 300 lines of code <laughs> to, <laughs> to put the same um, triangle up on the screen. Now, that said, Metal is very powerful. I'm not saying that you shouldn't learn these things. I'm just saying understand what they are used for. And again, there is only so much time in a day and only so much uh, things a person can work on. Know what they are, but you don't need to know everything about them. What you should know everything about are the frameworks and the game engines, right? Some of these you probably have already heard. I know we said one of them earlier. Uh, so Unreal, Unity, and the Apple Game Frameworks. And when we say Apple Game Frameworks, we're, what we're really saying is uh, Sprite Kit and Scene Kit, and now AR Kit. AR Kit is Apple's way of bringing augmented reality. Talk about having the best of both worlds, the real world and the, and the uh, game world. AR is really an incredible thing, and uh, we've seen some really neat examples come out recently and they just they just announced AR kit recently. But Unreal and Unity, those are all cross platform. So if if you do want to write games and you don't want to just stick with one platform, meaning you don't just want to write games for Apple or you don't just want to write games for you um, excuse me for Android, you know look at something like Unity, right? And Unreal. Both of those will work. But Unreal comes with a pretty hefty price tag. Uh, Unity does not. Unity, you can get in there and you can start developing. Both Chris and I know Unity and Apple Game Frameworks. Um, we also were very much uh, for Apple Game Frameworks over Unity. And then when we started to use Unity more, we realized, or at least I probably shouldn't be speaking for Chris, but Unity is really great. And it's just as great as Apple and Apple is really great too. So there's no favoritism here. It's all good, except Unreal. I, I don't really, um, I don't really play in that space a lot, uh, but I do know people who do, and they love it. So take a look at all three of these, and then decide where you want to, where you want to learn. So now you've you've got this this whole idea. You you figured out what you want to be when you grow up. You decided what kind of game you want to make. You decided what kind of space you want it to live in. Two D, three D, whatever. Do an AFD. You even decided what platforms you want to build for, and you've decided, I'm not really sure. I think I want to build for all of them, so I'll go with Unity. Or I'm not really sure. I just want to start slow and sort of work my way in. The uh, Apple Game Frameworks is, is a great place to start there. But whatever, you've decided that this is what you want to do. Now it's time to make a plan. And that starts with making a game design document. And here's the thing. Even if you're one person, one person, you still need a game design document. And it doesn't need to be huge. It doesn't need to be this monstrous thing. And in fact, you should keep this in mind. Game design document is a living document. It's, it's never complete, right? Until the game is complete. And then you create a new one because you're probably gonna create another game or another version. But the whole purpose of the game design document is to communicate the purpose of the game. And you need to, if you, especially if you're working with other people, it needs to be a guide for everyone making the game, all right? So Chris and I do a lot of, of work together, and if we didn't have game design documents, we wouldn't know what was going on, right? 
sometimes we'll, we'll have an idea and we'll work on it and we won't get back to it for two months later. And if we didn't have that design document to guide us and remind us of what we were doing, we probably would never be able to pick up where we left off. So Tammy, before you move on, just go one slide back. All right. <clears throat> just give us a quick example of a, a game design document. Let's use Flappy Bird. <laughs> Flappy Bird. But wait a second, does that really need a game design document? Yes, yes, it really does need a game design document. All right, so if I were to write a game design document for Flappy Bird, I would basically need to put in there the purpose of the game is, well, let me show you. Let me show you what goes into a design document. What goes into a design document is the storyline and the plot, the environment, the characters, and the objects, the goals and the achievements, and the terminology. So if we're going to use Flappy Bird as an example, and believe it or not, it's an excellent example, the storyline and the plot is simply fly this bird through these holes, through these pipes, and don't die. Don't hit them. Right? That's it. And honestly, that's all you need for the story and the plot. It could be one second, or excuse me, one sentence. It doesn't have to be this big, giant thing about the plot, because really, it, there's no plot there. But the idea is fly the bird through the pipes and don't die. That's it. Then you get to the environment and the characters and the objects. Well, the environment, it's, it's a 2D environment. And it's very simple. We're just going to steal graphics from, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're just going to borrow uh, graphics from Super Mario Brothers. And we're going to... Um, have pipes and, and bricks and birds, that's our characters, our objects. And again, the goals and the achievements, fly the bird through the pipes and don't die. And the more you do that, the more points you get and the more time you waste playing Flappy Bird and not other games. Now, I'll be honest with you, I love Flappy Bird. I have made Flappy Bird clones. I have a Crow's Quest that I, I don't have it published anymore because I didn't want to keep up with the, with, the, with, the, with the development of it. But it's a great game. It's a great concept. Games, and it, you all know it blew up in the gaming industry. So what you're making doesn't have to be difficult. It just has to be entertaining, engaging, and fun. So the other thing that goes into the game design document is terminology. Now, I live in America. I'm, I'm in West Tennessee. My partner, Chris. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Where are you, Chris? You're in South Africa, right? Yeah, South Africa. So we're forever fighting over terminology, such as, is it status or status? This is a thing we'll never figure out. But the terminology... <laughs> Wait, what is it? Status? No, status. <laughs> <laughs> but the terminology inside of a game design document is also important because there are terms, um, you know, like Chris was telling me, uh, not too long ago. What was it, Chris? R RPCs? Uh, NPCs. NPCs. Yeah, I should know that. I don't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> and those are the, the uh, non-player... Uh, Characters. Thank you. I told you I was running out of caffeine. I have hit the wall, the third wall. But yeah, so we have to agree on terminology, and that's very important. And again, if you're just a single developer, it's still important, very important. Because it's not, it's not just, okay, or what are you going to call these NPCs? It's what, what do I call the prizes in my game? Are they prizes or are they, you know, something else? Are they coins? So it, it's more than just standard terminology. It's terminology for your game. So let's talk about managing the game design document. It should be a collaborative effort. Chris and I work on our game design documents together, but only one of us actually touches it, right? So we'll have our meetings, we'll figure out what we're going to put in it, and then I go back and I put it in there. Because when you have too many people working on something, it tends to get a little weird. I also want to know your audience, okay? We don't have a lot of time. Chris is busy. I'm busy. The people you're working with are busy. If you write up... 50,000 page document that uses all these big giant words that nobody understands, then nobody's going to read it. So know who you're writing for, know who's going to read it. And above all else, be clear and concise. 
if, if there's something that goes into the game design document that you could say with two words and you decide to use two pages, it's not clear and concise. So do your best to do that. And again, we mentioned that it was a living document and the best place for a living document, especially one that you're collaborating with other users, is going to be online. I swear, don't print it isn't because I'm trying to save the environment. It's really because with an online document, especially one that's a living document, you'll be able to refer to it, change it, edit it. And honestly, once you print it out, five minutes later, it's probably gonna be obsolete, right? So let's take a look at some of the game art that uh, you know stylizes your game. Just like there were differences in game genres, there are with art design and direction. And you're gonna have things like pixel art and exaggerated art. And one of my favorites, hand-drawn art. And Chris's favorite is, Chris, what's your favorite one on this list up here? Uh, voxel art. Why do you like voxel art so much? Uh, it's, it's basically pixel art uh, in 3D space. And uh, yeah, it's easy to create. And it's pretty. <laughs> all right we'll go with that so if you're wondering all right that was a really big giant list but what do they look like right how can you talk about art and not show pictures well here's the pictures and the ones that are not on here i guarantee you if you pull up google and you do a search you will find the styles you're looking for but these are basic you can see on the left hand side we've got the pixel art which is kind of like the 2d of the voxel art which is right below it and those, you know, that's from Minecraft. When you move into the more realistic and the exaggerated art, you've got Battlefield 4, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, or excuse me, Horizon Zero Dawn. I have not played this game, but my son tells me it's epic. We've got Broken Age, which is considered hand-drawn. That's my favorite. I'm, I'm like a big proponent of hand-drawn art, especially for gaming. Then you've got this, this uh, cell shading, and I hope you all have seen Borderlands. It's a fantastic game. I, I absolutely love the artwork in that game. And the reason it's listed here as cell shading and other is because sometimes this game falls into that category, well, is it really cell shading? Is it something else? So again, there's a lot of uh, mixing and interspersing sometimes with these things. So how do you go about getting game art assets, right? What, what are the types? Um, I don't know where to start. Well, <coughs> characters, and you're going to need environment art, and you're going to need items and objects for your art, and you're going to need other assets. These are all different parts that you'll need for your art assets. These are the different types. And that's where NPCs come in, right? That's where NPCs come in. I, can't, I don't know why I was thinking RPC. I've got my brain on something else. So when you're, when you're looking at the different types of artists who are creating these assets for you, you're looking at lead artists and art directors, right? Um, and again, this could be you. This could be someone on your team. You're going to have concept and storyboard art. You're going to have character and environment art. And you're going to have animators and illustrators. And these people may be the same person or they may be different people. But these are all the artists that help to make up what you see on the screen when you're playing these games. So where do you get this art? How do you, how do you put it into your game? Where do you get it? Well, you create your own. If you're an artist, even if you're not an artist, you can create your own. It doesn't really take that much time. Well, maybe time it takes, but it doesn't, people think that they have to be like um, this fantastic, I use that word way too much. They have to be this great artist that makes this great work. You don't have to be, art is subjective, right? Yeah, well, that's where voxel graphics comes in. It's, you don't have to be fantastic. It, it's just blocks that you stick together. If you built Lego blocks ever before, that's how you create art, uh, voxel art. You just stick blocks together, and it looks good. It does. It really does look good. And Chris, you have a tutorial on Day of the Indie on how to create voxel art, don't you? Yeah. 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 Some oil thing. Yeah, you made a, um, I don't know, it was like a little sports car or something, like a, like a mob yeah, car. Really yeah, drag sure. But you could you could hire an artist if you, if you didn't want to take that route. You can also get free royalty. I don't want to. Say, I always say free. It's royalty free. There's a difference. Royalty free art online. 
And you can use a combination of all of that. Hire someone to do the parts you can't or don't want to do. Make the stuff that you do want to do. Um, have Chris teach you how to make voxel art if that's what you want to learn. So there's really the, the possibilities are endless there. So we're trying to wrap things up and just let you know that that's what's out there. That's, and again, this is just a beginner course. So we did, it's a 30,000 foot flyover to see if you're even interested in game design and development. Uh, but before we wrap things up, we want to go over some of the tools that Chris and I use at Day of the Indie that we use at some of our other uh, gigs that we do. And we want to cover them in a logical way. So we're going to go through documentation. What do we use to do that? What do we use for our graphics and animation, our music and sound, and of course our team collaboration. As you might have guessed, I handle a lot of the documentation. I, I love to, to have things ordered. So for me, and I believe Chris can agree on this, we're using Google Apps for most of what we do. Um, that includes docs, sheets, and drawings. If you're a Microsoft person, that is kind of like Word, um, Excel, and I don't even know if at this point if Microsoft has something that would be considered bug drawings. Is it, yeah, you think, yeah, I guess it would be kind of like paint. I don't know, probably. I haven't used Microsoft in so long, but I'm gonna defer to Chris on that one. Paint. Yeah, all right, we'll go with paint. For your, um, what do you call those things? You wire them up, Chris. See, lack of caffeine. Fire diagrams. Yeah, diagrams, thank you. We found a fan, I almost said fantastic again. You know, I stopped using the word awesome and this is what happens. I totally replaced it with the word fantastic. So for creating uh, graphs and, and things like that, we found Wired Graph Editor. It's, I love this tool. It, you can wire up things real quickly, flow charts, things like that. And if you're going to creating a game, especially like a point and click adventure game or any game for that matter, you're, you'll need to flow chart it. It's very important. For your graphics and animation, there's a plethora of tools to choose. You can use Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo, which are Chris's favorite. He loves those. Um, prior to using those, I was using the Adobe Suite, you know, like uh, Flash and, and Photoshop and Illustrator. Uh, Chris turned me on to Affinity Designer and Photo. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, I'm a recovering um, Adobe Suite user at this point. And I love Affinity Designer and Photo. I also love Clip Studio Paint. That's, I would have to say where Chris is big into Affinity Designer and Photo, I am big into Clip Studio Paint. Um, full disclosure, I am a, um, an official Smith Micro influencer. So I have to just put that out there as a disclaimer because the other tool that we have on here is Moho, which is another one of theirs. Uh, Chris and I use it for animation, um, but I, I assure you, I. I did not start as an official influencer. I started using the software and I loved it so much and I started creating tutorials on how to do it and they approached me. So if you have, and, and they're not even that expensive. None of these tools are. Blender, if you're looking to make modeling, that's a free application. Uh, Sketch, we have a new book in the works right now. Sketch is an app and that will help you create. It's kind of like Affinity Designer, just a little bit different but uh, that will help you create your game assets and things like that. And if you're interested in learning Sketch, like I said, we've got a, a book in the works that will be coming out soon. You can pre-order it now. You can check it out on the site. For music and sound, we're looking at GarageBand, Logic Pro, Adobe Edition. Now here I still use Adobe Edition for things that are outside of games. It's, it's, I love the app. Uh, but for music, Chris, he does most of our music for Day of the Indie, and uh, he could probably talk a little bit more about why he chooses one or two of these over the others. Well, some of them. <clears throat> uh, I, I basically used Reason for a while when I was still using uh, Windows, don't tell anybody. But yeah, I used Reason back then, and uh, what a fantastic application for creating music. Uh, I was introduced with GarageBand on my iPad and it was absolutely brilliant and where they took it um, on the iPad and also on the iMac, fantastic or awesome. <laughs> and then <laughs> I moved on to Logic Pro, which is basically GarageBand on steroids. Uh, 
it's a brilliant, brilliant application. And uh, literally, if you want to take your your uh, music seriously, Logic Pro, I can highly recommend that. Uh, Fruit Clips, I just add my fingers a little bit into that for a while. Very cool. Uh, BRFX, th this is uh, something, if you talk about music and sound, this is a very cool tool online um, that uh, can help you generate um, some sound effects for your games and it's for free. You can go there, there's a whole bunch of switches that you can uh, flip and you know create a whole bunch of sound effects. I actually created uh, all my sound effects for the book I wrote uh, in BRFX. Yeah, and just like music, or excuse me, just like art, music is subjective. Sound, not so much, but music for sure. So just because you don't think that you're good at it, don't don't, don't let that stop you, right? Just just do something. Put it out there. Get it done. Yeah, call it jazz. Call it jazz. <laughs> or, or a dubstep or something. Who knows? <laughs> um, I love stuff. I, I, hey, dubstep is pretty cool. I was listening to that before. All right, so we talked about team collaboration earlier. And again, you know, Chris is in South Africa. I'm in West Tennessee. We couldn't get farther apart from, from one another. Um, so, and we have to still work together. You know, we do, we do Day of the Indie. We do other projects together that are outside of Day of the Indie for other people. And how do we collaborate? Well, we're big into cloud space, Google Drive, Dropbox. These are free services. Um, if you want to have more space, you pay a little bit more, but to get in, it's free. We also use uh, shared code, right? Because we're both developers and we're both working on projects and we're sharing these projects with one another. And what we do is we store them on GitHub or Bitbucket. There are other services. Again, these are, these are just things that we use, tools that we use. If, if I were to pick a preferred one of these two, it would be really difficult for me, although they use the same underlying technology. For project planning, it's all about the Google Calendar and Trello. Again, free tools. Uh, if you want more space, if you want to be able to do a little bit more than you can with the free version, you can go with uh, paying it, and it's fine. For the communication, <laughs> speaking about paying it, you'll notice that uh, we use Zoom for ours. Um, we used to use Google Hangout, we used to use Skype, but for now all of our communication is done with Zoom. This is a new account for us. We've not updated it to the paid account yet because we're still working on you know, building our audience. Uh, Zoom was nice enough to give us some extra time on our meeting, which is why we didn't have to break in the middle and restart it. So that was good, thank you Zoom. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, another free service and their paid service is really not that much and we will be getting that very shortly. So those are some of the tools that you can use for creating your games and your apps. Well, not your apps, but I mean, yeah, if you want to make apps, you could <laughs> with all that stuff. Uh, that's how you collaborate with your team. So where do you go to next? What, what do you do next? What are your next steps? Well, first of all, you got to decide what your role is going to be. And when I say you have to decide what your role can be, I really mean that it can be one or the other. They can be both. It can be anything you want. Uh, the best the best advice I can give to you is to try a little bit of both, right? If if you want to try being a designer, no one is stopping you. Take the, the game that's in your head and get it out. Learn as much as you can about being a designer. You know, this this is your first step right here. This is kind of like I said, your 30,000 foot flyover. Um, this kind of decides whether or not this is even for you. You know, gives you a little information. But there's so much more you can learn out there. Um, and of course, you're lucky if you want to get into games, part of learning about it is doing your research. And in this case, doing your research is playing other games. So, you know, people say to me, well, you just, you're wasting your time playing games. It's like, no, I'm, I'm researching. You know, even when I'm, I'm creating comic books, I got to read comic books because you have to know what's out there in order to make what people want, in order to make what you want, right? And you have to get involved. It's most important. Um, you know, are Chris and I experts? Some would say we are, but honestly, we're not experts. We just know what we love, we know what we want to do, and we go and we, we get involved. And there are other people who might do this same webinar, and they might teach it differently, and they might be better at it. Who knows? 
but we're getting involved and we're doing what we can for our community. And don't worry about your level of experience. There's always going to be someone who knows more than you, and there's always going to be someone who knows less than you. And your job as being part of this gaming community is to get involved and to learn from the people who know more than you and to help the ones who don't, don't know as much as you. So that's what we mean by get involved. Now, the meat and potatoes of all of this is how do I really go to learn? How do I go to learn the code? And how do I learn how to be a better artist? And where do I learn that? Well, we mentioned at the top of this webinar that Chris is the author of the 3D Apple Games by Tutorials, which is done at uh, raywenderlich.com. You can pick up the book there. He's the author on that book, and I am the Final Pass editor on that book. This is actually how we met. Um, there's also 2D Apple Games by Tutorials. That was written by the tutorial team at raywenderlich.com. I'm <laughs> the Final Pass editor on that book as well. So those are two great resources to get you started in the game development arena uh, for Apple. And the reason, the reason it's a good idea to get involved here first, you know, with, with uh, Apple game frameworks is because it's, I don't want to say that it's easy to learn because for some people it may not be easy to learn, but it's, it's not as difficult or um, what's that word, Chris? Intimidating. That's the word I'm looking for. Not as intimidating yeah. as some of the other things. You know, you open up Unity and you get this, this giant screen, this interface, and it's overwhelming and intimidating. It's really not those things when you get into it and learn it, but when you first open it, it is. And Xcode, which is what you would use to program Apple games, is slightly less so. So that's why we always recommend people start here. And you got to mention Swift, Tammy. Swift is such a brilliant language that um, Apple created. And yeah. Uh, years and ago. In fact, um, we also have a Swift book coming out on Day of the Indie. It'll, it's in production now. And what's unique about this book is it takes you, it, it teaches you Swift from a developer's perspective, a game developer's perspective, as opposed to an app developer's perspective. Now, granted, you're still learning the same things. You're still learning about strings and you're still learning about um, iterations and, and for loops and things like that and proper structure and whatnot. But you're doing it in a fun way because you're building games throughout the process, right, throughout the book. And you are truly learning it from a game developer's perspective. So that is also available at Day of the Indie. You can pre-order it. Um, and for those of you who made it on the call, thank you by the way, we're so happy that you were able to make it. Um, as our thanks, we'll be sending out some information on how you can get a little bit more uh, discounts on those things that we have at, at Day of the Indie, the, the, uh, the books and, and tutorials at Day of the Indie. And of course, you know, you can find us at YouTube. We're, we're over there doing stuff. You can read our online tutorials, our video tutorials at dayoftheindie.com. And you can find us at, uh, at Day of the Indie on Twitter and on Facebook. And again, thank you all so much for coming. Um, hopefully you'll, you'll join us for our more advanced uh, courses where we really get into how do you create a game? What is the code behind it? How do I draw a character? Um, in fact, what I would recommend you all do is just look through the site, see if there's something, you know, cause Chris, we've only been doing this together um, a day of the indie for like four, five months, four months, maybe. Yeah, it's about five months. Yeah. So, and this is this is not what we do full time. Day of the indie is something that we wish we could do more of, but we still have other commitments that we have to. So, the content is not updated as often as we would like, but we are doing the best we can to to get it updated. Um, so, while there's not a huge amount of stuff over there right now. We are putting more and more as, as time goes by. So if there is something that you specifically would like to see uh, written about or a video about or discussed or whatever, drop us a line, let us know, and we'll do our best to get it online. Uh, so Chris, I don't have anything more to add. If you do, uh, feel free. Now's your, now's your chance, man. No, I've got nothing to add. Thank you, Timmy, and thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. All right, gang, we'll see you around the Twitter machines.
If you enjoyed watching this video, leave a comment, let us know on Twitter, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.